Mark Bridge is the technical advisor on uh, on, uh, on on Bronson, and uh, stalwart uh, Bronson friend and uh, and uh, member of the Free Bronson campaign unit, who was utterly aware that this was never going to be a Free Bronson film, but nonetheless was there to make sure that Charlie wasn't getting shot. What attracted me to the film, um, Charlie, nothing else, just Charlie. You know, I I don't care who wrote it, I don't care who filmed it. I don't care whether it was a play, I don't care whether it was, um, you know, like TV, you know, like for Channel 4 or BBC film, you know, with, it wouldn't matter to me. The only thing I'm interested in playing is Charlie and finding out about who Charlie is and, you know, what Charlie wants done with his piece, you know what I mean, and how I can cater to Charlie without being, you know, Charlie's puppet. My relationship with Charlie grew um, from phone calls. I remember he first called me up. Uh, he goes, he used to leave message after message on my answer about three years ago. He's left message was like, God, fucking hell, Tom, it's easy to get hold of fucking Santa Claus than you are. You know, at the new son. He goes, oh, well, you know, everybody wants you. I'll call again. And he called us like, boop, message 18. And eventually he goes, yeah, I pick up the phone at six o'clock. He goes, oh, I gotcha. I fucking gotcha, ain't I? I said, Charlie. He goes, hello, mate. How are you doing? I go, oh, I'm good. He goes, uh, What's going on? And I thought, um, and I just split up with my girlfriend at the time. And I thought, oh, well, do you know what? I'm going to beat around the bush. I'm just going to fucking tell him straight because, you know, break the ice. You know, I'm in a bit of a bad way at the moment. He goes, oh, yeah, what's the matter? I go, yeah, I said, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm just not, um, you know, I'm just not, not comfortable. You know, I'm, I'm saying goodbye to somebody that, you know, that I really love and I, I'm not, I'm not happy. I'm not in a good space. and. So I mean, I can't be with a woman, and yet I can't be without one. And I realised that you know I probably have a relationship with my mother. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, that is infused, you know, you know, infiltrated all my relationships with women. I always find myself stuck in a triangle that I'm trying to break this pattern, and it's really painful. And it's like therapy 101. Charlie Bronson, <laughs> the first time we ever spoke to him, I find myself repeating the same pattern, expecting a different outcome, the insanity, you know. And I just need releasing from this, you know, like, uh, I gotta release myself, I gotta do the work on it. I, you know, I, I don't know how to, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, right, right. He goes, Tom. But yeah. He goes, did you, uh, did you, do you remember the floods? Or when, when Oxford, he goes, yeah, the floods. Do you remember the floods? So like, yeah. He goes, do you remember that boy who got his foot stuck in the grate and the river kept rising? And he kept rising. And he kept rising and eventually they tried to get him out, but he drowned. Yeah, it was, well that wouldn't have happened to me. Right, because do you want to know why? I went, yeah, 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 sure, it goes, because I would have said, cut it off now. Tom, what I'm trying to say is, right, what I'm trying to say is, son, is sometimes, yeah, you've got to cut a little piece of yourself off, yeah, no matter how much it hurts, in order to grow, yeah? in order to move on. Do you know what I mean? What are you having for your tea? I went, oh, I'm having a steak. Goes, oh, 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 you can't. Goes, I fucking love a steak, mate. What's going on outside your window? I was like, fucking hell, this guy is dope. The first visit was really weird, you know what I mean? Because it was built up over two or three years of being involved, you know what I mean? And, I was, and, and it was like a deep breath out waiting to happen so by the time i got to outside wakefield prison uh and handed in my passport and went through you know the fingerprints and all that uh and security i was uh i was uh it was it, what struck me was how pedestrian it is to get in there you know it's like going to a municipal like a building or a hospital or you know um you know the smell of hospitals and you get you know Public institutions tend to smell very similar, you know, like, uh, in, like, um, it has that sort of slightly waxy, everything slightly waxy and greasy and over the top of, um, you know, you know the typical colours that you have in hospitals or prisons, you know, it's like pale greens, pale blues and just like solid stone structures and in case you know it was, it was just had the smell of a municipal building it was quite um pedestrian it was just not nothing like how like to silence the lambs you know the long you know multiple migs in the cell next door flicking his sperm in the face of clary Stalin in the dark you know that, that little 
tin chair set up outside or it wasn't like that it was you know it was like going into an, to an airport into an easy jet you know what i mean or something like that doing your bag of security dog comes and checks you gates open close you know electric gates open close eventually you're taken through the waiting room with all the you know the visiting room where all the other inmates you know are visiting their families are visiting the reception you you fill charlie's tray up you know, you, um you have to spend a tenner on him and he likes his chocolate muffins and his uh, strawberry and banana milkshakes or you know, and, and uh, his Galaxy and Jaffa cake muffins and uh, you fill 10 quid's worth of muffins, strawberry milkshakes and he gets his tin of, uh, his, what, the flask of coffee with Charlie right <laughs> on the front and, and gaffer tape and you've got this, you know, tray, school tray with all the, the, the lots of polystyrene cups and they put all the, like, give you loads of sugar for him and all the screws, um, all the wardens, whatever they're called, um, correctional facility officers, what are they called? guards and the wakefield they all know who you are when you walk in because obviously he's a he's a, a specific prisoner and he's quite a special prisoner charlie you know what i mean everybody knows he's there and he's been there for years and um a lot of these people have been with him for years and they're mixed views a lot of them think he should be out they don't think he should be there you know people are, uh, some i've never had anyone say be rude they always said hello tom how are you do you know what i mean yeah charlie's in good spirits this morning blah, blah. Uh, it's almost like you're going to visit a patient in the hospital, you know what I mean, as opposed to, you know, walking into technically the, probably the most dangerous wing on a prison we have in, in, in the country, you know, it's, it's more like walking in to visit your gran in hospital, if it wasn't for the keys and the locks and the, you know, the dogs and the, the guards everywhere. Uh, you walk out the back of the building, into the courtyard and big chain, chain fences and then through the other doors and then into a segregated sort of housing unit, which looks like a shoebox, flattened, squashed building, you know, one, you know, uh, behind a big brick wall structure. And then as you go through the gates, there's a door there. You enter a small courtyard with, with cages. And that's where you'll probably see Bob Maudsley, the cannibal walking around around in circles. Do you know what I mean? Um, because they're allowed a certain amount of exercise a day and they go and walk in circles on the yard and there's a mural on that wall and if you look up there's like sort of like uh eight foot by 60 foot worth of sky about you know 30 foot up yeah and that's all the sky that they've seen in years you know and then you, you face with the main building the shoebox building you go into it down some stairs and you know you're with a guard and there's about four or five guards meet you in there and you're in a room the size of an entrance hall but it's about the size of a normal bathroom and on the right there is a bathroom straight ahead there's a door that leads onto the wing and left there's another door that leads into the visiting room and the visiting room is a cell in itself so you it's empty there's no bed it's a dungeon type of cell but it's painted similar to these color walls you know that sort of I wouldn't say magnolia, <laughs> but it's not that magnolia with nicotine stain. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, then there's a dumb waiter, like like a hole cut in the wall, um, which leads into another cell. And so you're sat in a, you're standing in a cell now, with a, and it, below the dumb waiter there's a table which is bolted to the ground, and two chairs that are bolted to the ground. And through the dumb waiter, uh, which has a plexi which has bars on it and a plexiglass screen um is another cell and that's when you know they bring charlie in and he appears you know and in my in like the first time i met him he, never, he was so white he was blue so pale the first thing that you know i noticed about him it was the guy was you know like one of the fish that had been underwater for fucking years you know it's like white blue you know um pallor little purple spectacles on massive moustache big raised head skin tight white t-shirt you know with a little blue collar like the ones you had in PE in the 80s right? and uh, a pair of Reebok tracksuit trousers uh, Reebok classic sneakers on and he's like the back end of a fucking great white shark the way he moves do you know what I mean forearms covering hair and toes absolutely rigid still he appears from one side like a tv screen the dumb waiters like that and he appears from this side pokes his head out like mole from wind in the willows <laughs> just looked at me he's like tom hardy bill sharks huh what a part 
and his fucking hand comes through the gap, like, and it's just, just fucking, like, it was like, all I can, I just remember thinking, that's like the tail of an alligator, it's just <laughs> come right through the bars at me, and I'm holding the, his tray with goodies on, and it was like the first hurdle for me, because I have so many prejudiced and preconceived ideas of, I've got to shake that, because if, if I don't shake that hand, his hand in this, you know, then, you know, that's hugely disrespectful, isn't it? And part of me just didn't want to. <laughs> so I've got enough now, you know. Okay, I'm done now. But, uh, but then, you know, that was ridiculous. So I put the, 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 the um, tray down and I shook his hand. You know what? It, it was like, it, it didn't just dissipate. All my prejudices disappeared. I realized I was more embarrassed about not being hard and not being... Um, not being like from the street or from prisons and, and understanding that world, you know, everything that I could never understand. You know, it's like, I've always had a, a, a thing about wanting to, um, if, if, you know, being able to run a marathon tomorrow, if I get asked to do a marathon, I've got to be able to finish that marathon in time and win it tomorrow. When I went and I had the same thing about being in prison with Charlie, my biggest fear was, you know, looking stupid. And I'm both fear of being looking stupid, you know, you look stupid. So, so when I shook his hand, it's like, you know, it's odd. It was awkward. It was because I don't know him. And here I am, you know, I'm, I'm a, I profess to be able to play him or, or um, and I'm, and, and, and I, uh, I'm not sure if I can. Do you know what I mean? And like, and here I am with him in his house, you know what I mean? Um, about to start a relationship with him proper because I'd written to him, I spoke to him on the phone. But um it really did it really did it really did hit me that this guy is, you know, incarcerated, you know, twenty four seven, um in a shoebox in the middle of Wakefield, which is incredibly dangerous, you know. Transformation work, you know, cultural transformation and accent, you know. Um his voice, you know, comes from listening. There's, I got tapes of him on the phone talking to him. When I start to talk to somebody, if I'm going to play them, uh, I, uh, I tend to pick up their cadences and rhythms, and then eventually the voice mimics. You know, I just mimic and copy and copy. Then you find I find a lot of um, uh, somebody's voice and the way that they talk is a center into a character. You know, and um, so the voice is essential. How he talks, his rhythms, and how he moves, you know, physically will come from the, the voice. You know, um, in this particular occasion, it did anyway. Um, there's different ways to get into all kinds of characters. You know, but that's how I got to Charlie was initially because it was telephone contact through the voice and photos. So, and obviously, when you look at a photo, you have got the physical transformation. This guy's massive, right? Not as big in real life, but then you know, um, not as big. I thought six foot three, you know, again, wide as uh, wide as a mountain, uh, tree trunk legs. No, five foot nine. You know what I mean? My height. And he was 13 stone when he was 30. Right? And I sit, he's 16 stone now. So, you know, this is, this is doable. I was 10 and a half stone um, um, prior to initially doing the film. I just ate a lot of steak, you know what I mean? And a lot of chicken. I've really fucked my body up, to be quite honest. It was stupid. I'm paying for that now. The, the problem with Charlie is I need to put on a lot of weight in five weeks. You know? Shaving head is, you know, shaved head. You know what I mean? Grow a moustache, okay? They darken the moustache, you know what I mean? So, moustache is important not to have a fake one, you know? So, couldn't couldn't have a fake moustache. So, decided that we weren't going to go through the, the years with Charlie growing up and then turn, you know, and then him having a bald head and glasses at the end of it or the beard, because, you know, the beard changes, the moustache has changed. So we looked, we wanted a, an overall look which would suit from the beginning to end, you know, and take it away, you know, and create a, a fictional Charlie Bronson, as you were. So the look was um, based on how he looks kind of now, you know, but took it right back. So he's always looked like that. He's never not looked like that. And apart from when he was a little boy and he had no moustache, you know, uh, which I pref you know, it looks weird at the beginning of the film without having a moustache, so it's good to, you know, even the baby should have a moustache, you know, it's so important, it's like Coca-Cola, the brand, Woolworths, you know, well, well today, like, um, the moustache was really a, a key part of that. So I started growing a moustache, started eating a lot of chicken and chips and, and ice cream and, you know, like, creatine, 
and pushing a lot of floor and pushing a lot of weights and uh and they put on two and a, no drugs and they put on a two and a half stone just on a three stone in five weeks right it was fat as well, you know what I mean? Because he's a brawler's body. I had to get the brawler's body. Uh, stayed in the background, constantly through it. Was, uh, for me, it was so valuable to have on set at all times because I could run things by him, run things by Charlie, get things cleared. Um, and, 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 you know, between him and Nick, these are the guys that I was working with all the time, and Kelly to get the rewrites, you know, Nick to direct me, and Mark Fish for authenticity. And a constant dialogue, constant dialogue with them. You know, they were upset, you know, when they were upset about certain things which were in the script, you know, we'd either have to explain, you know, it would fall on me to explain why certain things were in the script, why certain choices had been made, and what was artistic, what was damaging, what maybe was not. Working with Nick is, is awesome because um, he has very specific ways of dealing with things. I like a director not, not to know where they're going and what they, you know, what they want to do with something. And uh, Nick, even if he's not quite sure what he wants to do, his, he will, he will um, have an, like an overview of what it is going to be like anyway. And it's going to be Nick's way. <laughs> no matter what. And that's really cool. Okay, let's do it. He lives, eats, breathes, doesn't sleep, film. And, you know, so you know you're working with somebody. I, I knew I was working with somebody who was not going to rest until it was done and done properly. I'm just in the right way. Oh, right, that's working.